This is one of seven colleges of the University of New Hampshire. Uh, we offer the very same diploma here as is offered in Durham in over 32 academic programs. This past year, we introduced uh, significant new academic programming in biotechnology, analytics, and homeland security. And uh, very proud of, uh, of what we have in play currently, not only for our first year students, uh, but for transfer students from our community colleges. I'll note that we have several students here from Nashua and Manchester Community Colleges. Our relationships with uh, these colleges are really important. About 65% of our students are transfer students from the community colleges. And over this past year, we've crafted nearly 30 um, curricula pathways so that if you're a first year uh, student in criminal justice at White Mountain Community College, or at NHTI, you can path your coursework right to this college to get a top off degree of Bachelor of Science in Homeland Security. Uh, we've done that in many other programs areas as well. And uh, tomorrow, we have a major celebration with all the community colleges, the Board of Trustees from this university, Board of Trustees from the community college system, the two chancellors, and just to celebrate this partnership that we have with the community colleges in the curricular pathways that we've developed. Um, it's of special interest to me to uh, welcome you today. Homeland Security, I think, is going to be one of our featured programs going forward for UNH Manchester, not as a standalone, but in conjunction with the University of New Hampshire and Durham. I think you'll see a lot of creative programming, uh, both here and in Durham, um, and not just face-to-face, uh, -face, but online as well, so stay tuned. What I'd like to do is to uh, briefly read an excerpt from a letter that we received from uh, U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen. She couldn't be here this morning, but Jean has been a friend of this university and certainly is very focused on homeland security uh, issues in Washington. Um, first, she said, please accept my best wishes as you gather for today's panel on cybersecurity. Thank you to both the University of New Hampshire for organizing this event and Jennifer Brand, Chris Breton, Cameron Schilling, and Jeff Stutzman for sharing your expert insight on this crucial topic. Protecting our nation's cyber, cyber infrastructure is one of our greatest security challenges. Intrusions by rogue actors in foreign governments undermines our economic competitiveness and threatens our national defense. The security of our electrical grids, transportation networks, and financial systems is at risk and safeguarding our digital infrastructure is a national imperative. The letter goes from there, but we have worked, suffice it to say, that we've worked very closely with Jean, her staff, and also the uh, Senator Ayotte on, on thinking through how we will evolve this program here at UNH. So we sincerely appreciate the Senator's support. What I'd like to do at this point, because you didn't come here to listen to me, is to introduce our host, uh, Jim Ramsey. Dr. Jim Ramsey. Um, he joined our team uh, just this past fall. Um, he uh, accepted a position here as a full professor in uh, Homeland Security, Security Studies. Comes to us from Embry-Riddle University in Tampa. Over a nine-year period, he developed uh, just a, uh, an unbelievable program around Homeland Security and Security Studies. Um, and I think when he left, and Jim, you can correct me on this, he had about 350 majors and 1,400 students were touching that program at Embry-Riddle. So we intend to grow something very special here at UNH Manchester through uh, the leadership of Jim Ramsey. Jim, would you join me? Good morning, everybody. I will. Uh... I don't stand and talk very still very well, so let me kind of, I'll, I'll try to do this to use the mic. Can you all hear me all right? Thank you for coming at, uh, under what I consider to be extreme conditions <laughs> from Florida. This is about 900 degrees colder than I'm used to, so I, I appreciate you coming out here, and I don't know how cars start in this weather, but they seemingly do. So um, I just wanted to say a couple things about the program and our unbelievable panel today. Um, uh, security studies is new for New England, relatively speaking, but there's a real hunger for it and there's a real need for it. And uh, so far I'm very proud of the students who have stepped up and joined the program. Um, a warm welcome to the community colleges all across the state of New Hampshire and greater New England, generally speaking. Uh, they're very welcome. Uh, we built a core of Homeland Security that uh, any 
associate's degree will be able to top off with a four-year degree in just two years here. So you bring an associate's degree to UNH and we'll get you a bachelor's degree in Homeland Security. Um, and the jobs are there. I had a 100% placement rate in Florida, and that's not to brag, that just forebodes what I want to do here. Um, the, the security studies industry is alive and, and it is all over the place. It definitely includes cybersecurity. One of the great things about cybersecurity, I think, is that it's, it's really rising as a, as a discipline. It wasn't too long ago that the concept of cybersecurity was not codified well in degrees. You had computer scientists, software engineers. You had all the STEM approaches walking into protecting our digital assets even if we could identify those digital assets. They weren't exactly quite clear yet. Um, but what we know today now from junior high school kids on is that ones and zeros runs our life. All right. So the economic imperative of protecting our economy and our national infrastructures is very, very clear. Everybody understands it. Um, you don't get paychecks. You don't pay for groceries. I mean, everything is really, really credit uh, oriented around digital assets. And there, anything that's digital is hackable. So protecting that is at the very heart of preserving liberty and the free flow of people and commerce, which is what we in security studies is all about. Um, as we go today, we have an unbelievable panel of experts who have you know, generously given their time and their expertise to be here today. Um, I will do my best to moderate, which basically means I'm going to be listening like you, um, and then just trying to create an ebb and flow as we go from our first speaker, Jenny, all the way to our last speaker. The speakers will come up here and they'll give a little presentation, maybe 10 to 12 minutes, on things that we've asked them to consider that are germane and, and specific to their discipline and their profession. And from there, you can hold your questions, you can write them on a little note card, um, you can keep track of them, or you can tweet them to hashtag cybersecurity. That's all great, um, but when we're done with the speakers, and I'll introduce one at a time, then they'll come here, um, I guess there's a fifth chair, I'll come up here as well, and you can ask any of us questions, okay? So uh, the, the questions um, uh, can be about the presentation or just anything that you find of interest or compelling or worrisome about cybersecurity. Um, so as we go from there, um, I wanted to uh, um, welcome uh, our panel, specifically a warm welcome, and again, a thank you for, for uh, coming today. And I want to introduce our first uh, panelist, Ms. Ms. Jenny Brand. Um, Jenny is a senior digital forensic investigator for Tech Fusion in Cambridge, Mass., as well as the chief technology officer for digital forensic solutions in New Orleans, Louisiana. She's an associate member of the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists and is currently pursuing her master's degree in digital forensic science. Her depth of knowledge stems from her education and over 15 years of experience working with digital media and handling digital investigations. As a result of her dedication to the field, Jenny has been a mentor and ambassador for the New Hampshire STEM Tech Women Ambassadors Program and has participated in the Cyber Fast Track Program at the Pentagon. So with that, please uh, join me in a warm welcome for Ms. Jenny Brand. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everybody. Uh, one of the things that uh, is not in the bio that Jim read is that I was a student here twice. I did my first degree here in psychology. I have my bachelor's in psychology. And I started my second degree here in computer information systems. And the reason why I came back to school is sitting in the back of this room right now. Uh, Carla Vogel. She convinced me <laughs> at the end of my first bachelor's degree that I should change my major, and I didn't listen because I was a young punk kid and knew better. Uh, <laughs> but 10 years later, I was back in her office saying, how do I do this? Uh, I love what I do. I love what I do every single day. I wouldn't have it any other way. And the reason why I feel that this program in particular is very important is because I encounter an awful lot of people every day who need to know not only what happened, but when did it happen and who did it. That is the heart and soul of my job. And I encounter a lot of things that are very suspicious and a, a lot of reasons why this is really an important thing to do. I think that what Jim's doing is fantastic and I sincerely hope that this program draws a lot of interest and a lot of candidates and hopefully you can place them everywhere they need to be because there certainly are not enough people in this industry. Uh, I'd like to say that I encourage anyone 
who's interested in any way to please, please go for it. If you think that you're not capable, trust me, believe me. I was told when I first started school that I needed to take four math classes before I could even take one for credit. I said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. And I found ways around that, uh, mostly through my professors here who helped me a great deal. And I found that in particular, UNH Manchester really helped in every facet of my education, from the people that I met in school, to my professors, to all of the various different opportunities it affords. So anybody who wants to do this, please do. Uh, as, as far as my work goes, <laughs> I can tell you that being a digital forensic investigator is probably the, the greatest decision I ever made in my life. It is not easy, it is tremendously difficult, and the challenges that I face on a daily basis as far as my clients and the things that I see range from <clears throat> who committed some sort of a horrific crime to who hacked into a corporate network to is my spouse cheating on me. I see everything you can imagine and probably a whole lot of things you wouldn't want to think about. But it's an incredibly important job to be able to do for the people who need it done. So when you're talking about things like who can hack into a system, the answer is anyone who is dedicated enough to do it. And that's the truth. If you want to be able to help keep those systems secure and keep information safe for anyone, this is the field that you want to be in. So thank you all so much for coming. I'll be happy to take any questions that you have later on. And I'll let uh, our next speaker go. All right, Jenny, thanks so much. Um, forensic investigation, does everyone here have a, a, a roughly vaguely notion of what that is? Forensics generally applies to lots of different sciences and digital forensic investigation applies to the systematic application of science to digital media and lifting information there. And uh, whether it's on your, I, we tell our students all the time, it's not safe on your phone just because you hit delete <laughs> or on your computer. So if you want to drive a spike through your hard drive on your laptop, that's one thing. But other than that, it might be gettable. So you might want to just think about not doing it at all. Um, so anyway, digital forensic investigation is one fantastic uh, uh, growth area in the world of cybersecurity. Um, we have different sorts of presentations for the rest of the panel. They'll give you different sorts of feels for the rest of the different kinds of activities that are going on under the rubric of cybersecurity. Um, our next speaker, Chris, Chris Brenton, um, has been an active member of the computer security industry for many years. He has been credited with the discovery of numerous security vulnerabilities and is a published author of multiple books on networking and network security. Chris was an active participant in the creation of the PCI DSS security standards, currently used to protect credit card transactions in public cloud environments. Um, Thank you, Chris, because uh, all of my credit card <laughs> transactions are in the cloud. Um, he is the primary author of the online security education material used by the Cloud Security Alliance. And for 15 years, Chris served as a fellow instructor for the SANS Institute, generating and presenting the content of a range of security topics, including incident handling and cloud security. Chris has also helped to kick off a number of well-known security initiatives, including the Honey Nut Project, the Internet Storm Center, and Dartmouth College's Institute for Security Technology Studies. With that, please welcome me and joining our, join me in welcoming Chris. Thanks very much. Good morning. Thanks again for coming out in the cold. So I've got three things I want to give you for nuggets to take away today. Number one, how to go about prioritizing your workflow if you decide to work, uh, get into this industry. Number two, how to go about and speak risk as opposed to security so people actually know what you're talking about. And number three, how do you get this stuff paid for? So where do you begin? <laughs> um, one of the common things when you get into security, or one of the things that a lot of folks have, is we tend to get a little obsessive about security and we tend to make that the major focus. One of the things you need to realize is that this needs to kind of holistically intertwine with all the other risks that are taking place within an organization. So while for security, this is kind of the main thing for us, for the people who are going to pay for us to make security better, they're kind of looking at risk overall. And that's really what you're going to want to focus on. The other thing you need to kind of take into consideration is what do your customers want? 
You know, in other words, when you start looking at how do I go about securing a network, let's say you've walked into an organization, you're the very first person who's tried to deal with security, where do you even start? Look for what your customers are interested in. One of the biggest mistakes I see folks make is they kind of think about security as insurance. And I mean, us in the field, we tend to think of it insurance. If you're thinking of it insurance, unless you have a Geico sitting next to you or someone named Flo, good luck selling it. What I like to do is I like to look at it as business enablement. You know, in other words, this is going to help your salespeople go out and get larger enterprise customers. This is going to help us if we're on the consumer side, maybe push into Europe and be able to meet the privacy concerns that are over there. So if you think, you know, this is going to allow us to help retain customers. So if you look at it as a sales enablement tool, it becomes a whole lot easier to try and get projects funded. So let's start off by talking, oh, let's kind of roll into talking about compliance. So compliance is one of these, I don't know, kind of love-hated things within the security world. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people say that compliance doesn't equate to security, and I'm one of them. It re, you know, if you look at most compliance attestations, if you do what they say and that's it, it isn't going to get you very far. But one thing compliance is really good at is loosening the purse strings. It's really good for giving a target that you can then go out and spend money on. The other thing I love about compliance is nobody understands these damn things. So I got a couple of members of my security team here. They'll tell you it's very, <laughs> gee, and we're being recorded, so maybe I shouldn't even say this, but it's not that often for me to interpret the 27001 attestation in a way that says we need two-factor authentication in order to do administration of our systems. Now, if you read that attestation, it doesn't necessarily say that anywhere. But is the person going through and doing the interpretation, it allows you to leverage that to be able to go in and do some real security. The other thing it's really good for is it makes it a whole lot easier to talk security to your clients. So if you don't have any security attestations and you're, let's say, in a business-to-business -business environment, and now you're trying to pull in somebody like Apple or Amazon as a customer, one of the first things they're going to want to make sure is any data they give you is going to stay safe. If you don't have any attestations, you're going to play 20 questions with them. Uh, Amazon security questionnaire, the first pass they send you has just under 250 questions on it. So think about what that's going to do for your sales cycle. Now, if you've got your ISO 27001, if you've got your SOC 2, those 250 questions now drop to about five. Makes it a whole lot easier. And there's a number of different ones out there. You know, how do you go about, you know, so let's say you decide, all right, we want to start accumulating some of these attestations to try expanding our business. Where do you even begin? I like starting with ISO 27001. Not the attestation itself, but the policy framework that's defined within it is really good. And then move on to other attestations from there, depending upon you know, what your business is trying to focus on. So what do these attestations look like? Well, like I said, they call out certain security controls that need to take place. Some of them are pretty specific, like PCI. Some of them are kind of generic, like 27001. But all of them, like I said, are somewhat open to interpretation. And if you're the security person, you can kind of help leverage that to try and bring in some decent security. Now, when we talk about controls, there's three components that need to be part of each control. And this is something really important. Even if you're not going after an attestation, if you're just trying to do decent security within your organization, there's three things to look for. One is policy. You know, let's make a declaration of what we want to do. People must change their passwords on a regular basis, whatever that regular basis time frame happens to be. Two, process. How are we going to actually force that? Because if we tell people, hey, change your password every six months, I can guarantee you maybe two people will, and that's it. And they probably won't be the people on the security team either. So you need a way to make sure it's actually taken place. And then three, this is where the security team comes in, audit, how are you verifying that that process is actually effective? How are you verifying to make sure that people are actually changing their passwords as they need to? And we talked about that one. The other big one is, and again, this goes back to what I started with, uh, be holistic in your approach. Don't have every security concern be, oh my god, it's the end of the world. You really need to prioritize these. And I can make prioritization of workflow really easy. First thing you want to look at is, will this risk put us out of business today? If it, would do it, if it could do it today, that's your number one task. If it's not till tomorrow, then it's probably something else you need to go and take a look at first. But it's literally as easy as that to kind of go through and figure out what you should be working on. 
So I want to walk you through a couple of case studies. And actually, I want some feedback on this, too. So we're going to look at two different security issues that were reported on the same day within an organization that's kind of a small startup. Let's call it 50 to 100 people, somewhere in that range there. Kind of a young crowd. They're a SaaS-based company, and they're focused on business-to-business -business solutions. So they have other businesses as their customers. And all of their servers are hosted in EC2. That's pretty common these days for companies to not actually run their own server infrastructure. So here's number one. So like I said, two security concerns get reported. Here's the first one. Front door's getting propped open all the time. So we've got a lock, but the lock is being bypassed by our employees because they've got friends that want to come in and stop by for lunch. Sometimes the friends stop in, sign in, sometimes they don't. But this, it's not uncommon to walk down the hall and say, who is that? I don't know that person. It happens pretty frequently. Problem number two, a flaw has been identified in the separation process where when someone leaves the company, whether of their own volition or not, their hardware gets retrieved, but we're not always doing a good job of cleaning up on their credentials. You know, in other words, their access isn't necessarily getting deleted. So, so you've got these two issues. So you've walked in, it's your first day, you get hit with these two things. What do you pay attention to first? Anybody want to take a shot? Number one. Number one. Why number one? Yeah, so these unknown individuals could have physical access to the internal company, which means they might be able to go in, grab a laptop, they might be able to see something, someone walks away from a keyboard. Anybody disagree? Why the second one first? Absolutely. So the answer was, we said that this is sitting in the cloud, which means it's out and potentially accessed from the, from the public. What if one of these employees that were separated that weren't happy that they were separated goes home, gets upset about that, and decides they're going to do something about it? So if we think about the physical access, Someone comes in, steals a couple of laptops, maybe gets five minutes at a keyboard, maybe sees something they shouldn't. That's all recoverable, right? That's something that would cause our business harm, but not necessarily put us out of business. This could put us out of business. Does anybody remember the uh, IT person in San Francisco that the, um, that, the, that the city separated with that had admin access to all the routers? and decided, I'm unhappy you separated with me and I have access from the internet, I'm going to shut the whole damn network down. Oh yeah, that one was fun. <laughs> that one was fun. So again, you know, I talked about, look at this from a what will put you out of business today standpoint. When you look at this this way, the physical access, that's kind of the draw. We live in a physical world, so we tend to kind of focus on that one first. But from a what will put us out of business tomorrow standpoint, definitely the second one. So like I said, what will put us out of business today? What will put us out of business tomorrow? There's your action item list. And within the business world, you can talk security, but you're not only always going to get people to listen. You know, we may understand security, others don't. You know, you want to get legal on your side. You want to get engineering on your side. But if you talk about it from a security perspective, even though a lot of what you say may make sense to us, a lot of times it gets lost in the translation. You know, like a server is vulnerable and could be compromised. I think we all hear that statement and understand what the ramifications of that is. But to a CEO, that doesn't necessarily rise higher than maybe a risk that legal is feeding to them. So you need to translate it, if you will, into a format the folks are going to understand. Like, hey, this could actually impact our ability to sell to our customers. This could cost us money. Once you start talking in that aspect, now it's a whole lot easier to get attention. And any questions, happy to answer them at the end of this whole thing. Thank you. Wow. Um, 
that was that was really good. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I, I think sometimes we think in society that cybersecurity is, you know, we think of, I don't know, when you when I talk to people on the street and they talk about sort of what we do, um, cybersecurity, I think people think about individual personal assets. I think we think about ISIS and and lately we've been thinking about, you know, state sponsored cyber terrorism from China and sources abroad and um, Russia. You know, but I think protecting the business, it's a business continuity and risk management, risk control, I think those are gigantic functions. So marrying the concepts of, of business enterprise protection, business continuity, continuity of government in your San Fran example, I think it was really, really, really critical stuff. Um, our next panelist is, is Cameron Schilling. Um, he's the Director of Litigation Department and Chair of the Privacy and Data Security, uh, McLean Middleton. Cameron is a shareholder uh, and director at McLean Middleton where he chairs the firm's Privacy and Data Security Group. His depth and breadth of experiences in data security include managing data security audits, preparing and implementing written data security policies, addressing day-to-day -day security issues, and investigating and remediating data security breaches. What do you do in the evenings? <laughs> Wow. Data privacy is another focus of uh, Cameron's practice, including creating and implementing privacy policies, terms of use agreements, information and use policies, and social media policies, advising clients about workplace privacy, social media, and consumer privacy, and ultimately handling privacy data, claim, or, uh, data privacy claims asserted against companies. And before we welcome uh, Cameron to the, to the stage, uh, I was reminded that the hashtag for tweeting questions is UNH cybersecurity. Is that, okay, good. UNH, hashtags UNH cybersecurity one string. So, with that, uh, a, a please warm welcome for Cameron. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone. So, to answer Jim's question, I'd be skiing if it weren't so freaking cold. Um, so, thank you all for coming. Um, and thanks for the great introduction, Jim. I'm really happy to be able to follow Chris because he gave a great intro to what I want to talk about, which is what we do to protect um, the security for businesses. Um, and Jeff Stutzman, who's going to come after me, um, is a great follow because um, that's a lot of what he does, too, is the bi business protection, government protection, making sure that um, the data that is sitting out there is not just hacked, not just subject to potential hacks, but is also secure from uh, accidental disclosure. So I'm going to, uh, in my brief uh, intro here, I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about what businesses can do and should do to make their data secure. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about is why that's so important. Um, and the how a business gets secure is a pretty simplistic process. You know, when I started to in this field years ago, um, I think the hardest uh, part for businesses to grasp and the hardest thing for me to convey to people who were looking to become uh, data security compliant is that it's 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 not it's not an insurmountable task. We listen to a lot of experts in the field talk about security, particularly technical security, and it's really confusing or we just don't understand it. But when you break the process down that Chris and Jeff and Jenny and I do, um, it really breaks down to a, a manageable process that normal people can understand and do when you get into it. So the what a company does is in the first instance do a risk assessment. And what we're all going to talk about a lot today a little, is what com components of a risk assessment are. Um, the risk assessment essentially, which is required by any regulatory regime, whether you're talking about HIPAA or the SEC regime or the Massachusetts regime or becoming SAS compliant or something like that, they all have the same components. And I'm really glad that Chris mentioned one that people forget about. That's the physical component of security. I think we think, uh, tend, tend to think a lot about data security as technical security. Firewalls, antivirus, anti-malware, penetration testing, the buzzwords kind of of today of data security. Definitely the technical component is one aspect, but the physical component is just as important and oftentimes forgotten. And then the third component, which is almost always forgotten or not talked about much, is the administrative component, training. 
um, having people in place that can handle your day-to-day -day security problems, um, and the other types of documentation that go along with, with data security compliance. So a risk assessment is designed to evaluate all three of those areas, physical, administrative, and technical. And then the, the outcome of any risk assessment, whether you do it under SAS or NIST or any of these other regimes, is a checklist, essentially a checklist to provide your business um, with a list of things and a priority of what needs to get fixed, what needs to get fixed the fastest. As Chris went through, you're going to look at um, your issue of not revoking credentials to to um, terminate employees before you might look at a security, at a physical security issue, but you're going to get a checklist. Um, at the end of that, and a timetable. And as businesses operate on budgets, a lot of times that's clicked into the budget because a lot of these security measures take money to fix. So you do a risk assessment, you have a security and vulnerability checklist, and then you create a written information security policy. I can't tell you how many times I've had people call me up and say, we need to become data security compliant, or we need you to check us. And I say, you know, what, do you, what, what, what laws are you governed by? Well, we're a business associate under HIPAA. Um, and we think we're data security compliant, we think we're HIPAA compliant, um, we, but we need you just to check us out. And I say, well, send me your written data security policy, and there's just silence. What do, what do you mean? Well, you, got, you have to have a written data security policy to be compliant with HIPAA or Massachusetts or anything. So um, that's the third component of, of what, what a company do, needs to do to become compliant. Once you do a risk assessment, you get your vulnerabilities checklist, and you put in place a written data security policy, and then train. And um, you know, as Chris or as Jenny mentioned in, the, in her initial presentation, the idea of data security is not perfection. Um, if a, if a hacker wants to hack into a company's services, it's going to happen. Um, the idea of data security is become, to become less vulnerable than you were before, or to become uh, to, to meet a certain standard of security or perhaps even, in the most cynical sense, to become more secure than the business next to you, because uh, if you are, at least you won't be the one, or not likely to be the one to be hacked. And the reason why I say this when I talk about training is because um, mo you, some of us in the room um, are probably the security officers for our companies. I am for my law firm. Um, you know, every, the, the, my three co-presenters certainly um, are are head and, head and shoulders above most people when it comes to security knowledge. But the front line of security is, is, is employees. Um, every employee in the business, they're the ones that are maintaining the passwords. They're the ones that are carrying around the laptops or the mobile devices. They're the ones um, that are on a day-to-day -day basis um, moving information around that we want to protect. And so Training is the fourth and, and uh, equally critical component of making sure a business is data security compliant, is safe, is secure, or at least more secure than, than the business that's right next door to them. So that's the what of what, of what businesses need to do to become secure. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the why. Um, and Again, when I started to do this years ago, I talked more about the why than the what because it was a process of convincing people that this needed to be done. Um, now it's a little less difficult to convince businesses that this is, needs to be a priority. In fact, um, I was just uh, down in New York City at an insurance, that cyber liability insurance symposium, and I met um, the, the CSO of Bank of America. And um, I was really lucky I got to sit at his table and I said to him, so what's budget like for you? Because normally, uh, you know, particularly at banks, um, everybody's fighting to improve their particular branch. He says, he said to me, Cam, I'm the only branch, the only division within Bank of America that has an unlimited budget. He, has, he can do whatever he want with, wants with security, which is pretty unusual. Um, so most, most businesses are budgeted on this. But, so let me talk a little bit about the why. So um, obviously, many businesses are subject to regulatory requirements, whether you're HIPAA or, or SEC or MASS or something like that. So many businesses realize that they have to do this. Um, whether or not they do is a different story. A lot of businesses are now being required as a result of being vendors to regulated businesses. 
You know, the key example, the main example of this is business associates under HIPAA or data security vendors under the SEC regs um, or other vendors that are just being asked to become SaaS, SaaS compliant or NIST compliant. And so business might do this so that they can sign agreements with their customers that say, we are this, or they can advertise, we are that. Um, but there are other reasons, too. So when I do a, a, a breach response, the first thing we do is I hire someone like Jenny to come in if I need a forensics person and figure out what was the nature of the breach, what was the scope of the breach, how much data was taken, who, what, who did it affect, what states are they from. Um, we figure out the scope of the breach. We hire, a, 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 in all, almost all instances, um, a public relations person because all data security uh, breaches our public relations issues. So between legal, like me, who usually runs it, PR, and forensics people, the cost of a breach typically, now this is a kind of a, an industry statistic, but is about somewhere between two and $400 a record for those three components. So you have a 1,000 record breach, and you're talking about a $200,000 bill just for the initial um, investigation and notification. Maybe that includes mailing costs, maybe it doesn't. Probably doesn't include call center costs. Um, it, it almost certainly doesn't include the costs of paying for identity theft monitoring and stuff like that, um, which is usually about double that. So data security breaches are incredibly costly from just a hard cost perspective. Beyond that, and what's more difficult to quantify is the reputational damage that a breach does. Um, particularly for professional services uh, businesses or other service businesses like law firms, accountants, banks, um, businesses that have, particularly small and medium-sized businesses that have a breach rarely survive it. I think the statistic is for a small or medium-sized business, about 30% about are still in business six months after the breach. So um, the why to do, uh, the, to do data security is not just you're required to do so under the law, or you're required to do so by your customers, but um, you're really required to do so as just as a matter of, of good business practice and business survival. So. so I thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions on the panel. Thanks. Cameron, that was uh, fabulous. Uh, um, I think you see a little bit of a pattern shaping up here from how we look at finding digital information to sort of the policies and procedures and continuity issues that are there to the why and the business case for why we are concerned with cybersecurity, generally speaking. Um, our, our next speaker, um, uh, where are we? We're, we're with Jeff here. Okay, our next speaker, Jeff, I think is going to speak to some really amazing uh, national level sorts of considerations, which I think you'll find really quite compelling. Um, Jeff is a Chief Operations Officer and Vice President of Collaborative Research and Analysis Red Sky Alliance. He brings a long history of building cyber analysis and sharing organizations to Red Sky's leadership team. Jeff founded Healthcare ISAC as a Naval Officer and became an early member of FIRST. Um, he was a founding member of the HoneyNet project and stood as a first watch standard during Y2K for SANS GIAC, now SANS Internet Storm Center. Stussman recently served as the director of the DOD Cybercrime Center where he built and operated the analysis and information sharing organizations behind the U.S. government's first cyber-focused public-private partnership where classified information was shared with members of the defense industry, the energy industry, banking and finance industries as well. In previous positions, Stussman was the U.S. Navy intelligence officer focusing on information warfare and IT project manager for Cisco, chief information security officer for Northrop Grumman's electronics sector, and head of Northrop Grumman's global APT, Advanced Persistent Threat Cyber Threat Analysis and Intelligence Organization, principal engineer for CERT slash CC, and most recently, the director of DCISE. And I don't know what all that means, but that's amazingly impressive. So with that, please give me a warm welcome to Jeff. So that was a really old bio. I'm not really sure where all of that stuff came from. But, uh, <clears throat> but the bottom line is I really love to have fun, and I love my job, and I'm going to tell you stories because that's how I, that's how I do business. Um, as he said, I'm an old intelligence officer. 
And I went to work for a big defense contractor, and when they realized that they might have a problem, I got tapped to build a team. And you know, at the time, I was kind of the stucky. But I really had a blast, and we had some pretty cool stuff. And this is what's grown out of that. As a result of that work, I ended up going down and building that collaboration at the DOD Cybercrime Center. And I did that for about three and a half years as a GS-15. I worked for Carnegie Mellon for a while. And, um, and now this is where we've ended up. So we've faced some real challenges. Every company is breached. Every one of you has your computers in your house compromised. You just don't know it yet. And so small companies, home users, big companies, my constituency, my customer list are 40 really big companies, typically global 2,000 size. We take the lessons learned and we boil them down and we send them out to smaller companies and that's what we do. Stolen privacy information is something you hear a lot about now, PII. Why would a sunglass company lose PII? because they have expensive customers. Their customers can spend a little bit more, they have places where they now can target, or those customers are CEOs in companies that can spend 200 bucks on a pair of sunglasses, or they're fighter pilots, right? Lots of reasons why a sunglass company might get hacked for their PII. And then last, government reporting is required. If you didn't know this, every company in the supply chain now has to report to the government when they have a breach. And when you report to the government, the FBI shows up. Kind of fun. If you like dealing with the FBI, I don't like dealing with the FBI. So, so what is it that we do? What is intelligence? Um, my claim to fame is I go talk to the boards and talk to the CEOs of a lot of companies around the world. And so one of the things that I've got to be able to do is say to them, listen, this is what intelligence is. Don't go swimming today. There are sharks in the water. And in two days, you know, light a signal fire because longer term there's a port about 100 miles from you and there's going to be a ship coming through. And then guys like Chris are going to come to me and say, okay, you just told my boss this really crazy story. What do I do about it? Here, right? Now I can give you the indicators, the snort rules, the ER rules and say, okay, I've told your CEO the story. This is why it's important to your business. At the same time, I could tell a techie how to fix it and what they have to do before they have their first coffee in the morning. And that's a really big transition point. So how is intelligence used? From a tactical perspective, you can use it to monitor your networks, your security posture of your suppliers, proactively stopping attacks. One of the things that we work very hard at is we call getting to the left of kill chain. If you're into kill chain, it's too late. Somebody, probably you, has already been broken into, so we want to get to the left of that. Speed up forensics, extend the life of current or older technology. So, so one of the things that Chris didn't talk about is that he was one of the original snort instructors years and years and years ago. This is where I learned from, from him, snort. We still use snort because it's awesome and because I have really good intelligence and I don't have to go buy a FireEye box and spend a million dollars to get it because the old stuff still works, and that's what good intel does. And then to plan strategies. So from a C-level perspective, what do I have to do as a CISO to make sure that my IT guy, my CIO, knows what he's got to do, and my CFO knows what he's got to pay for? This is a really big deal in any company that you work for, even a small one like mine, but in the big companies, it becomes even more problematic. OK, now I'm going to tell you stories. One of the things that we do really well is we get in the middle of bad guy activities. We don't break any laws. I know I'm being videoed, and I don't want the FBI showing up. So we're completely clean in this. But one of the things that we do is we capture keylogger caches. A keylogger is I send something to your computer. It captures every username, password that you log into, and then it sends it over to your computer. Now, I can find my way into that transaction. And I do that at about 200 locations around the world, and we, ca we collect about 18,000 new user accounts, including the server that you're logging into, username and password, every week. So right now, in the maritime business, we're collecting about 18,000 a week. We've got about 600,000 in 88 countries around the world, and this is the maritime space. And if you didn't know, this is one of the ways that drugs are moved. Bad guys are getting into the ERP systems. They're manipulating documentation. This is not an espionage case. It's not a critical infrastructure case. These guys are changing documentation so they can load things on ships, move them from point A to point B, and not get caught, and then get paid in the end. This is what's grown out of the old Nigerian scam 
IT infrastructure, the old 419 infrastructure is what they called it at the time. And so this is what's, this is what's come out of that. So I can tell you the story, and then I can turn around and say I can check my accounts every day to find out if you've got broken accounts, and if you do, we'll figure out how to fix that. From a more operational perspective, we, we got into a case a couple of years ago where we'd started out with a piece of forensics, and we have a small forensic lab, not anything like you guys, but, but enough to be able to do intrusion analysis, and we realized, hey, there's a bunch of guys that are talking to each other over a server, and I know the owners of that company that hosts the server. So I called them up and said, hey, man, can I have a copy of that? And they went, sure, come on down. So we sent a guy out with a bag full of hard drives, and they analyzed it on site with the team that was there. And what we found is we had instant messaging logs, and we had a bunch of other things like aircraft and submarine components that belonged to one of the defense contractors that I'd worked with in a prior life. And so we had 100 gigabytes of their data. We broke the encryption on about 15 so that we could show them what we had. Their security budget went from five people to about 20 overnight. So what this was is they bought an, a CAD CAM system, computer-aided drafting, computer-aided manufacturing, not from Autodesk, but from a European company, and the system had been Trojaned. And every time an engineer hit save, it was pushing the drawings to an IP address in Canada and then it was being swept up by bad guys later on. And they bought it in 2009. We found this in 2013. This is a monster 200,000 person company and their CAD CAM system had been Trojan for four years. All right, this is my favorite. This story actually ended up in the Christian Science Monitor um, about a year and a half ago. What you're looking at is Russian television station one on the eastern border of Ukraine. Okay, so why do we care? Well, the guy that's showing 37% of the vote, this is the presidential election in Ukraine. And this is the only television station allowed to broadcast throughout the night. He's showing 37% of the vote, but he actually has less than 1% of the vote. So this is an information warfare play. The Russians had trojaned the central election computing system in the Ukraine, broadcast fake numbers throughout the night that were broadcast on Ukrainian and Russian television stations all over. When the Ukrainians found out about it, they killed off the Trojan, they took the server down, and they went to the telephones and the computer systems and said, let's vote by email and by phone. Well, the Russians have this thing called SORM, which they'd implanted a long time ago to be able to monitor the internal networks the telephone systems. And so they activated this and they, and they did uh, denials of service across the telephony systems. And when they went to the computers and said, let's vote by email, they did mass DDoS against the, the computer system. So they had no way to vote. And then the Russians took down all of the television stations. They hacked the smart TVs and broadcast what the Ukrainians called aggressor media. And this was the only television station allowed to broadcast the election results through the night. And it was on the eastern border of Ukraine, around the time when the Crimea thing was going on. Eastern border of Ukraine, they speak Russian. They're pro-Russian. And so this was perfect. So 37% of the vote, he actually had less than one. OK, still, why do we care, right? So this is what my guys, my, my, they always have this meme of me, so what, so what, so what? The so what in this was the whole operation on the Ukrainian side was funded by one man who owned Privet Bank, the largest commercial bank in the Ukraine. His bank got hacked. They started taking the money out. The Russians went after the owner of Privet Bank because he was funding it to the tune of about $10 million a day. And um, a lot of the customers that I deal with in the US, banking customers, had their names on Privet Bank's website as investors. So these guys were politically exposed. And all of a sudden, bankers in the United States are being hacked because their name is on a website at Privet Bank who is funding the Ukrainian resistance during the presidential election. Kind of cool, right? Not only that, we were able to go back and say, here were the tools that were used when they stole the money from Privet Bank. And it happened to be, one of them was Black Energy, which was the tool that was used in the Ukrainian power outage just a few weeks ago. And we had this in 2014. And so did our customers. 
Okay, so this is kind of becoming old, right? We've got about 16,000 email accounts that belong to ISIS. Now they're Gmails and Yahoos and whatever else, and we could dig on that, but I'm not going to. Come on. So one of the things that I get the biggest kick out of is I can walk into a 50-person machine shop and talk to the CEO and say, listen, you've got a real problem. And he goes, oh, why would anybody want to hack my stuff? And I'm sorry, my fonts are off. It must have been in the translation over to the, to the other system. But uh, why would anybody want to hack a 50-person machine shop? Well, if you're in the IT business, the space business, the, uh, the electronics business, anything to do with aeronautics, uh, in 2006, those were the top priorities that the Chinese government was collecting on to build their own internal capabilities. And I could show you lots and lots and lots of different places where we built a bird and then they built a bird, and we sell it for $3 million and they sell it for $800,000. Huge, huge losses from a competitive perspective. But even in 2015 now, we're starting to see those same kinds of things taper off and we're seeing other things. Now, here's the problem. These are published works in China. And so when we see the published works translate over into real operations, we've got a problem. And now the people that I'm talking to are in the weather, satellite, and aeronautics businesses. And that's the number two priority in the Chinese targeting list. And so those guys are getting hit in a big way. Small companies are getting hit. Lasers and optics. So this is interesting. Why would anybody hit a laser? They want intellectual property? No. They don't know how to machine the lenses fine enough on the lasers to be able to build their own. And so they're looking for manufacturing processes when they go after the aeronautics businesses. And so we've probably got 200 of these companies all around the area that are supporting BAE. From an IT perspective, one of the big things that's going on is that Huawei is literally taking over for a lot of the big markets that we've had. And so one of the big challenges that they have is the BRIC nations, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China want to have cables laid under the water between them. The problem is cables take a long time to be dropped, and they're really expensive to maintain. And so why not steal technologies that have to do with pointing lasers from one satellite to another 3,000 miles away with almost no latency? Much easier way to go. A lot cheaper way to go, too, right? So, so this is what we're seeing. The IT, the satellite, the weather, because weather requires bandwidth. Carbon Act was a very cool one. This is a... This is a story that came out in February of last year. I'm watching my time as closely as I can. I thought I had this down to 10 minutes. But Carbonac came out. Ed Kaspersky was on, a, was on a tour around the U.S., PR tour, told the New York Times last year, hey, there's a problem. The online banking systems are compromised and people are losing their stuff. And, uh, and it's all American and Australian banks that were targeted. We happen to know that that wasn't true because we had worked with Kaspersky six months prior, built out the infrastructure and showed that it was Eastern European, Ukrainian, and Russian banks that were compromised. But we had six months notice just by virtue of the fact that we put ourselves into that decision-making process that these guys were working through. Sony was the same way. So this is kind of a fun story. We were in a chat session with a guy named Abdillo. Abdillo's in prison now. But he was an engineer that had been reverse engineering Sony or munitions, unexploded munitions, and found that they had Sony components in them. And so all of a sudden, he's up in the underground saying, let's get people together and start going after Sony. Now, this is one piece of the story, not the entire story, and, uh, but it was still good. All right, so who's doing this stuff? So just from the space perspective, I took one targeting list, about 45 very, very good groups in China that are going after aerospace and space technologies. And WECB is like the number, guy, you know, the number one group that people know. Everybody seems to know the WECB name. But they don't know this guy. This is Zhao Yan Lin. Zhao Yan Lin is the guy that built those virtual servers where I told you I got the instant messaging stuff before. And he reports to this guy, LX Ghost, who reports to Chao Lin at the top of the food chain. And Chao Lin's email is in the middle. And all of those things are the things that he communicated with, either through remote access to the machines or to the people via instant messaging. That's, that's the whole chain of command that he was using. Pay attention to LX Ghost. He is the guy on the left. That's Hong. Hong is a, uh, an employee of a company called Nonsec. Uh, he was hired out of McAfee in Beijing. He writes really good bad guy code. 
And at the same time, he's a researcher for Microsoft and others. He's an O-Day researcher, but he writes stuff that's, that's pretty cool. Wuhan Ching, I love this guy. Wuhan Ching, in the middle, is a senior cloud security architect with Alibaba. And he's also the leader of the group called Phantom Security. It's not really a security company, though. And so you've probably figured that out already. Now, here, here's the cool thing. For the longest time, we had, we had diapers and baby formula sent to him because he had a newborn. And so the idea was, let's figure out how we can maybe stop an attack at the source. Well, you could do that by turning off the American baby formula for the newborn. Um, Eju Singh on the right. This is the only picture that we've ever seen of him without a camera in front of his face. He has perfect tradecraft. He works for the Chinese Ministry of State Security, and he's focused specifically on manufacturing companies. He's the guy that they call when nobody else can get access to the systems. He does it. This is a partial targeting list of the types of companies that, uh, that would be affected. This is this one group's one-page targeting list. Of course, it's a lot more, uh, but this is what they look like. So what are the challenges? I think I put up one slide from a student's perspective. Look, here's the deal. I could get computer scientists all day long. Forensic people, everybody calls himself a forensic expert. There are very few that are really, really good at it. But I need thinkers. I, I need liberal artists. I need political scientists. I need people who can think about what it means. And I love the, uh, I love the quote, right? They get, they get their hats stolen by birds while daydreaming. This is, what I, this is what I really like. I like people that will sit and scratch their heads and figure out what this really means. OCD. Analytic curiosity is my number one, right? So I had, uh, I had done a, an interview session a while ago with, with a mutual friend, and we put up a sign with a webcam, and the sign said, wet paint. And the guy that we hired was the guy that lifted the sign and touched it to see if it was wet. And then he kind of went, yeah, so I knew that was the guy. So analytic curiosity, number two, if you can't write, I don't want you. If you can't string two sentences together, don't even apply for the job. 80% of the new college grads that we have that come to our door never get an opportunity because they write like they text. So if you can't write, don't come to my door. If you can't speak clearly and communicate a message, without saying dude or like or um more than twice in five minutes, don't come to my door. <laughs> you got to be able to plan. You have to be able to think two and three and four steps out. What are the implications of the things that you're going to do? What is the process that you want to use when you're going to monitor that underground IRC that's not going to get you caught? How do you do that silently. I want you to think through that process. And the last is analytic rigor. Anybody else here know what analytic rigor is? This is one of the things that if you go through intelligence training, they teach you from day one. One source means nothing. Two sources means, hmm. Three sources means I'm scratching my head. I think I have something here. And the more sources that you can line up that confirm your story from various perspectives, the more clear your picture becomes. So analytic curiosity and analytic rigor are the two things that I look for. That's my story. How did I do? All right, Jeff, that was uh, fabulous. Well, I want to say uh, a special thanks to all the panelists, but we're just getting rolling here. Um, uh, we're kind of going to go into the question and answer segment at this moment. I'm hoping that you've kind of had some questions motivated and just came here with some burning, compelling, you know, curiosities about this. Um, a, a shout out to the students that are in the room here. I think Jeff's last couple of comments are, are really spot on. Uh, I started out life as a biochemistry major. I don't know if any of the guys at the table started out in college majoring in what you're doing in. So life doesn't happen around bachelor's degree majors. Life happens because you're motivated and you're persistent and you're passionate and you desire to do a really good job. So if you're in the audience wondering about what you're going to do uh, for a career, please go ahead and, and uh, oh great, we've got some questions. Um, go ahead and, and continue to pursue excellence and, and I think the world opens up to you. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite the panelists up here to take a seat.
seat, and, and we kind of will enter the, the Q&A period just a little bit. Um, a reminder, hashtag UNH cybersecurity, um, or we've got some note cards right here. Um, I've got a handful of questions I'm certainly curious about, but let's start with what the audience has already submitted. Um, so I don't want to be in front of anybody here. Uh, let's start with uh, Aaron. Um, Aaron asked, what is a greater technical threat, hacking or penetration, or human threats, the social engineering component? And I guess this wasn't addressed to a particular panelist, but uh, anyone wanting to tackle that? Definitely social. And to go back to Cameron's comment about um, the employees are your front line, that's really the big one. Um, we do phishing testing at my place at least once a quarter, sometimes more often. Um, and I've got a couple of my team members here. They can speak to what was their favorite pen test. But my favorite was we sent in a phishing email to try and get people to click through, but specifically did it in such a way that it would end up in their spam box. Because we were curious how many people would not only go into their spam box, but then ignore all the rules we taught them and then click the link and run the Java applet anyway. Um, that's really the big thing, because you can have a great security team, but if one employee falls down, that's usually the foot in the door. So there's almost never a breach that isn't preceded by a human being contacted first. That's the bottom line. It used to be that we would just scan lots and lots of computers, and that was the opportunistic stuff, right? We'd find a machine, break it in, you know, find a woo FTP vulnerability or something like that. But wow, I'm really showing my age. <laughs> but 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 now, but now it's all about communicating and tricking the human. I'll, I'll follow up on that with a little bit of um, specific information too that'll give you a, a sense as to where security is going. So if you look at the statistics, the a huge majority of individuals affected, if you just count the individuals affected, are attributable to credit card skimming schemes. Um, Target, you know, um, Kohl's, TJ Maxx. Um, with the new chip technology, a lot of that is going to go away. It won't go away immediately because people will still run and have um, things where you swipe your card. But so. Let's take away that huge number of, of people affected. When you start looking at it, the next major um, area is employee mistake, by far. Um, you know, lost laptops, compromised passwords, it, it tri things attributable to non-malicious acts, at least by the individual who has um, made a mistake. Um, and more than that, um, and I'm going to pass this on to my co-presenters because I know they're going to talk about it. Um, the, the, the wave of security is going away from just financial theft. In other words, I want to get your credit card. Um, because by and large, that's not a very profitable way of stealing money because as soon as your credit card is compromised, they just cancel your number, you get a new credit card, and the thief's got to go back and find... Yeah, that's why medical records are actually worth more in the black market today than exactly. the credit card numbers. The, the wave of, of, of security now is going towards the theft of personal information because an identity is worth a lot more than a credit card number. Um, am I allowed? Okay, uh, that's a great point, and I would just like to kind of chime in on a personal experience, um, which I use in my classes all the time in terms of personal identity. Um, I received a letter from a large Midwestern university with which I had been affiliated. I um, won't tell you their name, but their mascot looks a lot like a badger. Um, and uh, I received a letter that they had a system that was compromised. I mean, you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned letters going out and, and sort of the the, the the post-traumatic stress disorder that happens in organizations trying to manage these breaches. Um, and they actually said in the letter that we don't know how much data was compromised. Um, it took personal identifying information that we had collected from you um, when you were here X number of years ago um, that we didn't need while you were here. So uh, I, I think you mentioned policy and procedure and some of the human element there. So here we reflexively capture personal identifying information. In the old days, uh, social security number, now we use student ID number. Um, 
but this university was collecting social security information for a database that didn't require social security information. It was a library checkout system. So a backdoor into identity theft was to go into this university, steal personal identifying information from a database that seemingly was totally irrelevant to any and all things. It wasn't transcripts or anything like that. And then they could backdoor that into having a whole bunch of information about people's identity. So when you called the university, their, their call service answered, well, you know, when you were here, we didn't need that information because when you checked out books, it was everything was just tied to it reflexively. You know, we collected, here's your name, here's your address, here's your social, blog, here's your phone number, and all you were doing is collect, checking out books, right? You didn't need any of that stuff. So the downstream hackability of a database that had collected information that wasn't required is really kind of a fascinating thing. I think as we move forward, looking at the human element here, when you design databases, only put the information in that you really are, is absolutely essential to this because this is something that can happen downstream. Um, uh, Jeff Chris, could you please speak about the adversaries against whom legitimate organizations are building security defenses? <laughs> yeah. So, so from a PII perspective, there's a lot of you know simple activity. This is the simple stuff, right? So PII, we've already kind of talked about that. From a larger perspective, one of the things that we're looking at. I mean, this is. One of the places that we focus are in the, the nation state. So I don't do any work with the government. Everything that I do is, is commercial, and they're, you know, they want to know what are the things that I have to do before I have my first coffee in the morning, and what are the things that will steal and shut down my company uh, by the end of the day if we get if we get breached. So obviously China is a, is a big one. It's been around for a very very long time, uh, but but some of the others. I mean we've. We've done we've done profiles and targeteer reports on on Iran and the Syrian Electronic Army and even Anonymous, right? Anonymous is not all that sophisticated, but they've got a movement, and you you have to think about that. So here's one of the things that you don't ever think about: <clears throat> the opportunity for loss if you if you end up in the newspaper is oftentimes a lot more than the opportunity for loss of intellectual property or or something that's that gets broken. Right, so you have to respond to the press. I think you were the one that mentioned that you bring in a PR person. You have to respond to the press. Those things take time. I mean, remember when RSA got broken into? This was a really, really big deal because all of the big companies that used RSA had to bring in had to bring in you know new, new tokens, but they also had to deal with the litany of, of government folks that were parading through conference rooms, wanting to know what was going on, or the other people that didn't that didn't know what was going on. So so all of the activities around that just be by virtue of the fact that it, it played out in the press, so. No, I'm there with you. Well, one of the more compelling aspects, I think, is you mentioned, I think, Jeff, at the end, statecraft. Um, for those of, is everyone, uh, uh, statecraft is, is a portfolio of skill sets and personality traits, I would argue, that um, precludes or, or not precludes, but uh, poor trend someone's ability to actually carry yeah, out. Yeah, so we, we have a little bit of a different definition, right? Advanced persistent threat just doesn't mean that Sophos doesn't find it. It means that it's a government that's sponsoring the activity against your network. And one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years is we've gone from one or two governments around the world to roughly 140 that are doing this against us. Uh, the United States is one of the few countries in the world that doesn't allow our intelligence arm to to help benefit the local economy, right? So competitive intelligence bleeds over into into government intelligence in many parts of the world. The United States is one that uh, that, that that doesn't allow that. So from a statecraft perspective, look, the numbers are huge, but most people don't see it because that stuff is very quiet, except in places where you've got E5s and E3s that are manning the keyboards, and they're a little bit louder, but those guys are becoming few and far between. And we can move down to the next level in that, and we've got the NGOs, right? So we got to think about ISIS, non-government organizations, uh, places like ISIS. Uh, it used to be that there were some in Mexico that we dealt with, but a lot of the, a lot of the, the criminal organizations, uh, the leg legitimate NDOs, and then we can move down into uh, stealing things for money, mob, and then kids. Right, very uh, seemingly mundane things, but uh, critical to our national security posture. Um, the next question um, is to all panelists, what cybersecurity threat concerns you the most? The Internet of Things. Oh, good question. Could you say a little bit more about what that means? So the Internet of Things is you not only have a cell phone, you not only have a laptop, uh, your refrigerator is now online, your thermostat is online. 
Yeah, exactly. Your car. Nest. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is you have a lot of new players getting into writing software that have absolutely no idea how to do it in a secure fashion. And you're typically talking about devices that have their code burned into chips in such a way that you're probably never going to get an update. So it's one of these, so with, you know, with Windows, you can find out there's a problem, or with Apple or with Linux, you can find out there's a problem, release a security patch, install it, and yeah, okay, that was horrible, but at least now we're better. With a lot of these devices, that never happens. And some of them are just, one of the things I think that frustrates me the most is that we're seeing a lot of the same really brain-dead stupid things being done today that we went through in the 90s that we figured out was a bad idea, like, let's hard code in an administrator account that the owner of the device can't see or delete. And one of my personal favorites was the router where they went through and they said, oh, you figured out that the, you know, this was the login name and password. We're just gonna create a different login name and use that same password and call that the patch. It's and, like, and make sure that that stuff goes out in our documentation so you can set up your yeah, own. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as far as like, how to collect a huge botnet to, you know, and then one of the other issues with that is now if I can start compromising the Internet of Things, I start making this guy's life a whole lot easier because once I've gone through about four or five hops, it's a whole lot harder to try and track it back to me. So I, I completely agree. That's the number one security threat. I'll give you my number two, um, and it's generally called outsourcing. So um, it seems like businesses more and more think that they can solve their problem by pushing it off to somebody else. Whether it's, I'm gonna host my data in the cloud, or I'm gonna buy this piece of proprietary software and they're gonna host my data, or I'm gonna, uh, I'm a medical, I'm a, a healthcare company and so I'm gonna buy an EMR. Um, and all well, there are Western Bloc nations that work very cheaply writing the code. Exactly. So, and, um, so businesses are really trying to get rid of a problem by outsourcing it, and really what they're do doing is just buying into other problems. Um, and the reality is if a business's data is breached, um, it's the business that takes the hit for it, um, whether it, their data is in the cloud or it was a result of their uh, uh, flaw in their EMR technology or something like that. We have a saying in this business, if you own the data, you own the problem. And so you can't really outsource your problems. That actually, to, to build on what Cameron just said, I think that's probably one of the most important aspects of all of this. If you own the data, you do own the problem. And many people think that because they're, they're hosting their data with Amazon or whomever, Microsoft, well, it's secure. You cannot assume that. You absolutely cannot assume that. So uh, let me ask a follow-up to that. Uh, because this ship is not going backwards, and the cloud seems more popular now than it was five years ago or 10 years ago, um, how, from a social engineering perspective, because I think that's kind of where we're going, um, how do we actually change hearts and minds, if you will, behaviors, if you will, how, how do we walk into the next step of our existence as an economy, as a nation state, as a species, when more and more of us is further and further out there, not only just personally, but professionally, how we conduct business. It's becoming global, it's becoming transparent, it's becoming hackable. Um, is this doom and gloom, or do you guys see a, a lining? Well, I see a lot of the end result of the problem, so. Uh, no, it's, it, it certainly has gotten better over the years, but it seems that uh, sort of the, the side that we're on, we're always playing catch up to the guys who are heavily funded to go ahead and attack you know, the, the security that's already out there. So it, it is sort of a constant, who can be better at it? You know, how fast can we get it done? How fast can we get into it? So I run an information sharing group called Red Sky Alliance, and um, <clears throat> Red Sky Alliance is 40 really, really big companies, 100,000 computers or bigger. Uh, those, those 40 companies represent just tens of millions of computers around the world, and so the idea with Red Sky was to try to figure out how do you get the word out as quickly and efficiently as possible to a lot of folks that can affect a huge number of computers around the world. And so one of the things that we really love is the idea that we could talk to 40 CISOs or 40 heads of threat intelligence 
and within a couple of hours have protection mechanisms to tens of millions of computers all, all over the world. We, we think that that's a, just a force multiplier, and we're seeing more and more of these uh, activities pop up, like, like the information sharing and analysis organizations that you maybe have seen uh, Greg Tuhill out talking about uh, as they're building out, or, or the information sharing and analysis centers. So we write, uh, my team writes intelligence for the financial services information sharing and analysis center. So when we publish something, it goes to about 14,000 banks around the world. Um, just the idea that you can have that many people communicating uh, so very quickly and have the ability to change BGP routes if you have to, uh, to, to push things to specific locations in the world or to see things coming from specific places in the world. Uh, again, getting to the left of the kill chain, right? So I don't think we're headed for doom and gloom. I think right now it is a little gloomy. So companies, when they outsource data, they just need to find a, a really competent vendor f for them and do the due diligence that's necessary to determine whether or not the person that you're outsourcing to um, has taken their care of their own security concerns. Now, sometimes that means for a business that they have to spend more to um, purchase a solution that is secure as opposed to spending less to purchase the one that's insecure. Um, and that can be a bit of a problem if you're trying to run a business and you need to sell a product. But the, the solution is, over time, we all as consumers are going to become more aware of um, buying services that are secure. So it, the security has got to be built into the business model. And, and to some extent it is, um, more and more, as and particularly because of things like we're doing today, be raising awareness about why security is important. So, so Chris and I have a, have a common old friend. His name is Fred Kirby. And uh, Fred was one of the original guys that used to say to a supplier, and Fred was the, the information security officer at the Navy Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren, Virginia. And he wouldn't let a supplier connect to his network until they went through an entire, at the time it was his, his work, it's now ISO 27001. But you had to not only go through this thing and show that you were compliant with his certification, you had to show him that you had processes in place to be able to maintain these things. And he would spot check you on a moment's notice. And so basically what that's turned into these days is ISO 27001 plus CMMI. And so if you think about snapshot plus ongoing processes, Fred was one of the old dogs in this game. Yeah, although to kind of expand on what Cameron was saying, I mean, the outsourcing thing, I don't actually look at that as always completely bad. Um, I've <laughs> So I started off doing forensics, and one of the things that I learned really quickly is most companies really have no idea how to protect their own data. And it's also not their primary business avenue. I mean, you know, Jeff and his team, they live and breathe security. They know what they're doing. But for most companies, it's, you know, I just want to stay out of trouble. So to have your servers in Amazon, as opposed to trying to create and spin up and run a data center for yourself, maybe not such a bad idea. Great, great thoughts. Um, I love this next question, but is there anything from the audience? Anyone right now that didn't write? Yes, ma'am. Uh, How much uh, darknet activity? Uh, Absolutely. Is spent? Yeah, uh, between between darknet and Tor, I've got people that spend all day long in darknet and Tor. But remember when I said planning? We don't use new college graduates to go to darknet and Tor because they get caught every time. So I could. So I've got a funny story about Jeff that I want to convey because him and I have known each other for quite some time. Uh, so this goes back to the late 90s. There was this group running around called G-Force Pakistan. And the news was playing them up as, oh, they're this elite group of hackers. And part of why we started up the Honey Net was to grab folks like that. And one of the things we got lucky with is they were actually running all their communications through us. So while the USA Today was, you know, kind of billing them as this elite hacker group, we were seeing that you know, they were using Telnet for everything, that they didn't know how to use VI, that they just, you know, had very minimal technical skills. But we started tracking them. And one of the things I came across was uh, they had broken into a website that was 
part of Jess Purview, and we had collected some data on him, and I kind of connected with this guy and said, hey, so I don't know if it's helpful to you, but we think we've kind of tracked down geographically what area these, this group is from. And Jeff looks at me and goes, I can not only tell you their names, I can tell you what they had for lunch. <laughs> the problem is they're in a country where we can't touch them. And that really is kind of the core issue. I mean, you know, all the panelists kind of talked about there are state-sponsored actors doing these things. If you're state-sponsored, you can sit there and bang away as long as you want to until you get it right. And that's a lot of what we're dealing with. So that was one of those cases where for four weeks I had a small team that sat in the back room and we brought in pizzas 24 hours a day. And, uh, and we were able to come back to you guys and say, listen, these guys are not a big deal. And we kind of joked about it. And then there was a 17-year-old kid that was heading up the team. And, and he was flirting with some girl. And he was eating Cheetos online. And, and he was running attacks against all this stuff. And it was all just by looking through the, the, you know, the dark web and knowing how to, how to uh, translate the language. You do need to keep up with what's going on out there, though. You need to keep up with the trends. You need to, to sort of see the direction things are heading. And you, you do have to maintain some contacts there, like it or not. It, it is part of the world, and it is part of what we deal with. So, so if you don't know what's going on, how are you going to know when you encounter it in the field? Well, and again, to go back to, I, you know, I know Red Sky's gotten a lot of press, but <laughs> um, that was one of the coolest things about it is when you look at the bad guys have these networks to communicate. The good guys, it's a whole lot harder, especially a good guy network where we can talk about this stuff and not worry about that the bad guys are listening to and be able to kind of pivot on what they're doing based on what we figured out. So Chris and I were one of the, or two of the founders of the HoneyNet project years and years and years ago. And it, at the time it was, I think it was about 15 people or maybe 20 at the time. Then it grew out to about 30 and now it's about 1,800 people around the world. And so literally they've got computers that are just deployed on places that you would never imagine. Uh, SCADA systems and you know, whatever. Thousands of these things and the data comes in and they're able to analyze it quickly. Uh, but one of the, that was absolutely one of the co coolest things from uh, from figuring out how to monitor the dark web. How do you control computers that you've got loaded into the dark web? And that became a tool called CBAC, right? And how do you trip alarms on the other side so that you know what's happening? And that became a tool called Snort. And how do you monitor the metadata from one network to another? And that became NetFlow data you know, monitoring. And so you know, being able to just have people in the dark web is, is OK. But being able to really systemically go after it and figure out what's going on underneath is, is huge. And to kind of tie it back to where we are here and then to find the talent to actually deploy and run this stuff. Yeah. yeah, so that's another thing. You and I have talked about this. It takes a year between the time we get an analyst on board and the time when we actually even let, let them sit alone. I mean, the amount of hand-holding that goes through this is just and Kaylee was one of our earlier uh, interns. We've had a couple, but it takes an enormous amount of time. Most of our interns don't succeed because they just don't have the stick to it or the discipline. Or Kaylee not only succeeded, I stole her from him. <laughs> he, he did. Yeah. So your own form of cyber espionage. Well done. <laughs> Um, look, this is. She went someplace good. She, well, that's well, as long as that's good. Uh, we have like five minutes left, and um, I want to leave us on on a very nice note. Um, th there's one question here that was submitted that I think is kind of interesting. So I, you know, both, and, and there's a myriad of topics we could get into social media and its linkages to national security because of of how it tends to work, um, but. And so feel free to bring in some of the things that we talked about before this, but this question is kind of interesting. Uh, culturally, where are we with understanding cybersecurity? Are we equivalent to Florence Nightingale at the Crimean War? And I'm just wondering, you know, because we're entering an emergent discipline of skill sets, people that you're looking for, a next generation of technology, a next generation of user. I mean, think of the speed of change and the fact that, say, my dad fought in World War II and now he's still living in age with an iPhone. So given that as a basis, what is the next 40 years going to present in terms of technology? It's risk exposure. The operating environments will be in there. And where are we moving? And culturally, maybe if we could kind of wrap this up and have you all give a, a parting shot in the last five minutes, that would be awesome. I think that we're a little farther ahead than Florence Nightingale at the Crimean War. <laughs> and thank God we are. Um, I, I do think that 
sort of the, the way we're heading, people are taking it more seriously. There are a lot of really brilliant people in the industry who are very encouraging. It's not, uh, there, there is a lot of competition to see who can sort of be the best at it, but it's, it's more of come on board, come join our team, uh, and sort of events like this are, why is this important? It's important because we need more people on our side. So I do think that we're, you know, we're making progress in this arena. I guess I, I agree. We're not, we're not uh, so far back as to be holding hands with Florence Nightingale. Maybe we're at the happy days stage. Um, you know, we're, we all love our technology, um, and there's no doubt that um, we're going to keep buying it and keep demanding that it get better, but we're still happily kind of, most people I think in the world are happily kind of unaware of uh, just how significant the risks are. And, you know, we're about, you know, we're in the 50s, whereas we need to be in the, you know, in the next millennia uh, on, on security. We lost a lot of ships to submarines a while back. And then about 20 years later, we figured out how to fight that submarine to submarine, PTs flying over the ocean. And so it took about 20 years to figure that out, maybe a little bit longer, plus or minus. But one of the things that I see now is in dealing with the big companies, a lot of these big companies have figured it out. And so it just becomes normal to them. This is the new normal. It's routine. They can handle it. They move on. And so a smaller company will cost, especially in my line, it's about a million and a half dollars for every breach that happens from a state-sponsored actor. So one of the things that I'm seeing is that those lessons are filtering down from the really big companies who know how to do this stuff. They don't like it, and it's still painful, but it's becoming normal for them. So they, you know, they filter down. So. One of the things that I would tell you is we, we published a paper that we, uh, we offer out for free. WAPACLabs.com, it's called uh, Fighting APT and Surviving. And you can download it for free, but there are seven things that these big companies have figured out how to do. Is it perfect? No. Are you still going to get breached? Absolutely. But it's normal now. They know how to deal with it. They can work through it. They know what protections to put in place. And, um, and now we're starting to see those lessons filter down. So I don't think it is doom and gloom. I think it's just a matter of learning how to fight submarines, and everybody needs to be on board. Yeah, I guess I see us at kind of a <laughs> Mad Magazine spy versus spy range right now, uh, where you know need kind of drives both sides. We get a little bit better at protecting things. They get a little bit better at breaking in. Um, you know, where's it going? Some of the stuff that, I mean, you know, Jeff talked about the need to be creative. Um, some of the things that people have figured out how to do have just blown me away. I mean, you know, old school, we go back and it's, you know, oh, if two systems are not connected on the same network, they're not going to infect each other. Well, that's no longer true today. Folks have actually figured out how to do it with RF, figured out how to do it with light waves. Wow, okay, now we need to step up and figure out, okay, A, is it a threat we need to really worry about, and B, oh my God, what the heck are we gonna do about that? So, to me, it's more, <laughs> it's kind of, it's the cycle of life, right? You, you know, we're gonna figure out how to fix things, they're gonna come up with more creative ways, and that's gonna drive our end again. There's also a profession built around this now, right? Yeah. And when's the last time you had a blue screen of death? Fortunately, not for a long time. Um, well, I just wanted to say uh, to, the, to the panel, your, your passion, your professionalism, the fact that you've dedicated your lives to such a big part of our economic and national security, I really applaud that. And thank you for your time and your energy today. And thank you to the audience. Uh, this may not still be on, but thank you to the audience for, for your time today. And if you have any questions, please contact us. We'll be uh, trudging along as we move into the future. And uh, be safe and be warm today. Bye-bye. <laughs>